introduce Chaitanya Nagar first. Uh, Chaitanya wants to introduce himself. But still, still you can, still you. Arishad Parik sir, apne aapka unmute kar lijiye. Chaitanya Nagar sir, okay. apne aapka unmute kar lijiye. Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. I like uh, good good morning, friends. Today I like to introduce Chaitanya Nagar, speaking about knowing oneself. Chaitanya Nagar is a journalist, writer, and a very sought after speaker, both in Hindi and English, on profound problems facing mankind. He is also a student of Krishnamurti's teachings. He had been associated with Rajgat Center for close to three decades in different capacities, such as joint coordinator of study center, as an editor, editor of Parisamvad, a quarterly magazine published by the Krishnamurti Study Center, as head of Krishnamurti Study Center in Vasanta College, and as an English teacher in Rajgat Basin School. Presently, he is working as a translator and writer and lives with his family in Allahabad. Okay, Chaitanya ji, please. Thank you, Harsha ji. You have spoken more about uh, me than even I knew. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, all of you, Sushil ji, Prakash Toke ji, Modak ji, all my friends in the indoor Krishnamurti circle for giving me this opportunity to speak. I've been away for the last few weeks because of uh, several reasons which I've been sharing with Sushil ji, and I'm happy to be back today. Uh, the theme that I'm supposed to speak on is knowing oneself. Uh, I would like to begin with something very insightful that uh, Krishnamurti himself says in a book titled Exploration into Insights. I hope I am sufficiently audible to all of you, right? Yes, yes, very clear. Okay. <clears throat> I quote, to know oneself is one of the most difficult things because in the observation of myself, I come to a conclusion about what I am seeing. I think we need to pay attention to each word here that I am reading because this is a very profound uh, statement that Krishnaji has made about knowing oneself. I'll repeat, to know oneself is one of the most difficult things because in the observation of myself, I come to a conclusion about what I am seeing. And the next observation is through that conclusion. Can one observe the actual anger without any conclusion, without saying right? wrong, good, bad. Can one observe holistically? Self-knowledge is not knowing oneself, but knowing every movement of thought. Because the self is the thought, the image, the image of K and the image of the me. So watch every movement of thought, never letting one thought go without realizing what it is. Try it, do it, and you will see what takes place. The book is Exploration into Insight, to Insight. 
I just want to speak a little bit about this quotation. He says, when we observe, there is immediately a tendency to arrive at a conclusion. And when uh, another observation takes place, it is based on the previous conclusion. For instance, I observe anger and say it's a bad thing. It's a toxic emotion. And that's a conclusion that I have arrived at about this emotion. Next time I observe the anger, it is with the same conclusion. So he's saying, is it possible to observe from moment to moment a fresh as if one didn't know anything about what one is observing. Now, that's a very interesting thing. And he says, knowing oneself doesn't mean self-knowledge is not knowing oneself. Now, the word knowing, the Sanskrit origin of the word or the Sanskrit uh, equivalent of the word is jnana. Uh, which is not the same thing as knowledge, as we know it in, in English, which is an additive process, which is a process of accumulation, where memory plays a role. It also implies awareness. In Sanskrit, when we say jnana, it also means awareness. Uh, Krishnaji uses the word knowledge and we understand it uh, in the same sense in which it is used in the English language. But uh, I just wanted to share with you that in Sanskrit, the translation of the word is often um, uh, done as jnana, which includes awareness too. Now, knowing about oneself which is like gathering, gathering data about oneself through books on psychology, through sessions with psychotherapists, like give me information about anger, give me insights into anger, and I gather information. And on the basis of that, I say, I know anger. Uh, I think Kay would say that this is not knowing yourself. Knowing about yourself is not the same thing as knowing yourself. There's a difference. It's like, I know Mr. Verma. He lives in a certain city. I know his house number. I know the members of his family. I know his profession. But I don't know him. That doesn't mean that I know him. So knowing others and knowing, having information about others, Knowing oneself, having information, knowledge about oneself are two different things. And I think we must know the difference. This is important that Krishnaji points out in this paragraph. So he says, often people say that Krishnaji doesn't offer a technique. That's one difference that he has with other spiritual teachers that he doesn't say. He says, the truth is a pathless land, which means there is no technique, there is no method, there is no authority, there is no teacher, and so on. But here, uh, in a very subtle way, he also tells us what to do. For instance, he says, watch every thought. Do not let a single thought cross your mind sail through your consciousness unnoticed, unobserved. So that's an enormous task. That's a huge responsibility that he has. He has perhaps given to those who are students of the teachings, who read his books. So it's not that, it's not a technique. Of course, it's not a technique. It's not a method. It's something that goes on. I don't know how many thoughts pass through the mind from the moment we open our eyes in the morning until we go to bed. Maybe hundreds of them. He says, watch every thought. 
follow a thought to its logical conclusion see the origin now all that is actually even if it is not a technique it's really a lot of work now uh, okay that that was my understanding of the quotation that i shared with you now is there a me you see this inquiry into oneself wanting to know about oneself is is, is very central to almost all philosophical religious inquiry they say even in some ancient christian texts the question of who uh, uh, one is what one is was very important but later it was replaced by an implicit an implicit faith in uh, in christ but earlier in some of the very old manuscripts even in christianity the question was had a lot of importance in buddhism in hinduism it has always been so ramana maharshi turned it into some kind of a mantra he said to all his followers just ask who am i who am i but here there is a very interesting thing that i want to share with you krishna ji say that the question who am i is wrong actually one should ask what is i he says the word the sentence the question who am i may have some personal connotations but when you ask what is i then you are asking about a structure which is shared by all of us there's nothing personal about that i everybody has an i so when he says replace it with the question what is i it's something interesting so he says just without um, owning the without claiming any ownership of i just know the structure of i which as it exists in each one of us so there are a few questions is there an i which is independent of thoughts emotions and reactions or what i call the i the self is just a symbol of ourselves of all the reactions that we have just a symbol it symbolizes our memories our emotions our sensations our thoughts we generally think when we go into this question that there is a, a thinker of our thoughts that i think my thoughts i feel my feelings is it true or the i is just producing thoughts or these feelings are happening to nobody there is just a movement but there is no center and the feeling that there is an i having these feelings and thoughts is just another thought that's a question that i think we should all explore together if possible i would like to share with you a video because as i said this question of who am i is as old as the hills ever since man walked on this earth i think perhaps he has asked this question uh, when he saw disorder in nature when he must have seen disorder within one self he must have asked this question uh, what this is what the hell is this is this thing called me what's going on inside and outside something that is beyond my comprehension uh in a similar fashion i mean this is a very old question it has been uh, explained and people like socrates even before i mean both buddha was almost like a contemporary of socrates in india he also talks about knowing oneself the upanishads talk about self 
knowledge. They use Sanskrit words like Atma Bodh, Atma Sakshatkar. Uh, but uh, Krishnaji steers clear of all this jargon and he just says, uses a simple uh, expression like learning about oneself, knowing oneself. Uh, as I mean, even we have a philosopher, a British philosopher, it's quite popular, who is a philosopher and a journalist, has written about 20 books, Julian Baggini. Uh, he is also the co-founder of the Philosopher's Magazine. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that the search is still going on, even in the 20th century, even in the 21st century, people who have been discussing and trying to explore the true identity of, um, of man, what is, true, what is the true self of man. There seem to be too many of them. There are, within one person, there are so many different selves, it seems. So I just want to, uh, to share with you a short video of about 10 minutes. I will request uh, Sanjeev Sharma to share his screen and show the video. And then after the video, uh, we watch the video, we may discuss some questions and then also go back to what Krishnaji says um, about self-knowledge briefly and then invite other speakers. Please, Sanjeev. Thank you. Is there a real you? This might seem to you like a very odd question because, you know, you might ask how do we find the real you? How do you know what the real you is and so forth? But the idea that there must be a real you, surely that's obvious. If there's anything real in the world, it's you. Well, I'm not quite sure. At least we have to understand a bit better what that means. Now, certainly I think that there are lots of things in our culture around us which sort of reinforce the idea that for each one of us, we have a kind of a core, an essence. There is something about what it means to be you which defines you, and it's kind of permanent and unchanging. The most kind of crude way in which we have it are things like horoscopes, you know? People are very wedded to these, actually. You know, people put them on their Facebook profile as though they are meaningful. You know, you're a Chinese horoscope as well. There are also more kind of scientific versions of this. All sorts of ways of profiling personality type, such as the Myers-Briggs test, for example. I don't know if you've done those. A lot of companies use these for recruitment. You sit, ask a load of questions, you answer a load of questions, and this is supposed to reveal something about your, your core personality. And of course, the popular fascination with this is enormous. In magazines like this, you'll see in the bottom left corner, they'll advertise in virtually every issue some kind of personality thing. And if you pick up one of those magazines, it's hard to resist, isn't it? Doing the test to find what is your learning style, what is your loving style, what is your working style, you know, are you this kind of person or that? So I think that we have a kind of common sense idea that there is a kind of core or essence of ourselves to be discovered, and that this is kind of a permanent truth about ourselves, something that's the same throughout life. Well, that's the idea I want to challenge, and I have to say now, I'll say it a bit later, but I'm not challenging this just because I'm weird. The challenge actually has a very, very long and distinguished history. So look, here's the common sense idea. There is you. You are, uh, the individuals you are, and you have this kind of core. Now, in your life, what happens is that you, of course, accumulate different experiences and so forth. So you, you have memories, and these memories help to create what you are. You have desires, maybe for a cookie, maybe for something that we don't want to talk about at 11 o'clock in the morning in a school. You will have beliefs. This is a number plate from someone in America. I don't know whether this number plate, which says Messiah 1, indicates that the driver believes in the Messiah or that they are the Messiah. Either way, they have beliefs about Messiahs. We have knowledge. We have sensations and experiences as well. It's not just you know, intellectual things. So this is kind of the common sense model, I think, of what a person is. There is a, a person who has all the things that make up a life, the experiences. But the suggestion I want to put to you today is that there's something fundamentally wrong with this model. And I can show you what's wrong with one click, which is 
there isn't actually a you at the heart of all these experiences, right? Strange thought? Well, maybe not. What is there then? Well, clearly there are memories, desires, intentions, sensations, and so forth. But what happens is these things exist, and they're kind of all integrated. They're overlapped. They're connected in various different ways. They're connected partly, and perhaps even mainly, because they are, belong to one body and one brain. But there's also a narrative, a story we tell about ourselves. The experiences we have, we, we remember past things. We do things because of other things. So what we desire is partly a result of what we believe, and what we remember is also informs what we know. And so really, there are all these things, like beliefs, desires, sensations, experiences, they're all related to each other, and that just is you, okay? It's a very sort of, in some ways, it's a small difference from the common sense understanding. In some ways, it's a massive one. It's a shift between thinking of yourself as a thing which has all the experiences of life and thinking of yourself as simply that collection of all experiences in life. You are the sum of your parts. Now, those parts are also physical parts, of course, brain, bodies, and legs, and things, but they aren't so important, actually. You know, if you have a heart transplant, you're still the same person. If you have a memory transplant, are you the same person? If you have a belief transplant, would you be the same person? Now, this idea that what we are, the way to understand ourselves, is not of some permanent being which has experiences, but is kind of a collection of experiences, might strike you as kind of weird. But actually, I don't think it should be weird. In a way, it's common sense. Because I just invite you to think about, by comparison, well, well actually, think about pretty much anything else in the universe, maybe apart from the very most fundamental forces or powers. Let's take something like water, right? Now, my science isn't very good. Uh, we might say something like water has two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, right? We all know that. No one thinks, I hope no one in this room thinks that what that means is there is a thing called water and attached to it are hydrogen and oxygen atoms, and that's what water is. Of course we don't. We understand very easily, very straightforwardly, that water is nothing more than the hydrogen and oxygen molecules suitably arranged. Everything else in the universe is the same. There's no mystery about my watch, for example. The watch, we say the watch has a face and hands and a mechanism and a battery, but what we really mean is we don't think there is a thing called the watch to which we then attach all these bits. We understand very clearly that you get the parts of the watch, you put them together, and you create a watch. Now, if everything else in the universe is like this, why are we different? Why think of ourselves as somehow not just being a collection of all our parts, but somehow being a separate permanent entity which has those parts? Now, this view is not particularly new, actually. It has quite a long lineage. You find it in Buddhism. Uh, you find it in 17th, 18th century philosophy, going through to the current day, people are Locke and Hume. But interestingly, it's also a view you're increasingly being heard reinforced by neuroscience and everything. This is uh, Paul Brox, he's a clinical neuropsychologist. And he says this, we have a deep intuition that there is a core, an essence there, and it's hard to shake off, probably impossible to shake off, I suspect. But it's true that neuroscience shows there is no center in the brain where things do all come together. So when you look at the brain, and you look at how the brain makes possible a sense of self, you find that there isn't a central control spot in the brain. There is no kind of like center where everything happens. There are lots of different processes in the brain, all of which operate in a way quite independently. But it's because of the way that they relate that we get this sense of self. I call it, the term I use, the term of the book is called, the, I call it the ego trick. But it's a trick in the sense that not, it's like a mechanical trick. It's, it's not that we don't exist, it's just that the trick is to make us feel that inside of us is something more unified than is really there. Now, you might think this is a worrying idea. You might think that if it's true that for each one of us there is no abiding core of self, no permanent essence, does that mean that really the self is an illusion? Does it mean that we really don't exist? There is no real you. Well, a lot of people actually do use this talk of illusion and so forth. These are three psychologists, Thomas Metzinger, Bruce Hurd, Susan Blackmore. 
A lot of these people do talk the language of illusion. The self is an illusion. It's a fiction. But I don't think this is a very helpful way of looking at it. And go back to the watch. The watch isn't an, an illusion because there is nothing to the watch other than the collection of its parts. In the same way, we're not illusions either. The, the, the fact that we are, in, in some ways, just this very, very complex collection, ordered collection of things, does not mean we're not real. And it can give us sort of a, a very sort of rough metaphor for this. Let's, let's take something like a, a waterfall. These are the Iguazu Falls in Argentina. Now, if you take something like this, you can appreciate the fact that in lots of ways, there's nothing permanent about this. For one thing, it's always changing. The waters are always carving new channels with changes in tides and the weather. Some things dry up, some things... Uh, you know, c new things are created. Of course, the water that flows through the waterfall is different at every single instance. But it doesn't mean that the Iguazu Falls are an illusion. It doesn't mean that it's not real. What it means is that we have to understand what it is as something which has a history, has certain things that keep it together, but it's a process, it's fluid, it's forever changing. Now that, I think, is a model for understanding ourselves. And I think it's a liberating model. Because if you think that you have this fixed, permanent essence, which is always the same throughout your life, no matter what, in a sense you're kind of trapped. You, you have a kind of, you're born with an essence, that's what you are until you die. Maybe after, if you believe in an afterlife, you, maybe you continue. But if you think of yourself as being in a way, not a thing as such, but a kind of a process, something that is changing, then I think that's quite liberating, because unlike the waterfalls, we actually have the capacity to channel the direction of our development for ourselves, to a certain degree. Now, we've got to be careful here, right? If you watch The X Factor too much, you might buy into this idea that we can all be whatever we want to be. That's not true. I've heard some fantastic musicians this morning, and I am very confident that I could no way be as good as them. I could practice hard and maybe be good, but I don't have that really natural ability. There are limits to what we can achieve. There are limits to what we can make of ourselves. But nevertheless, we do have this capacity to, in a sense, shape ourselves. The true self, as it were then, is not something that is just there for you to discover. You don't sort of look into your soul and find your true self. What you are partly doing, at least, is actually creating your true self. And this, I think, is very, very significant, particularly this kind of stage of life you're at. You'll be aware of the fact, how much have you changed over recent years? If you have any videos of yourself three or four years ago, you probably feel embarrassed because you don't recognize yourself. So I want to sort of get that message over that what we need to do is think about ourselves as things that we can shape and channel and change. This is the Buddha again. Well makers lead the water. Fletchers bend the arrow. Carpenters bend a log of wood. Wise people fashion themselves. And that's the idea I want to leave you with, that your true self is not something that you will have to go searching for as a mystery and maybe never ever find. The, to the extent you have a true self, it's something that you in part discover, but in part create. And that, I think, is a liberating and exciting prospect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you so much. Yeah, basically, what I wanted to emphasize is uh, the search, the seeds that have been sown in the human psyche millions of years back. This, uh, uh, this urge to find out what one is, is still in operation. It started long back, even in the 21st century. People are looking at this question from their own angles, from in their own ways. What perhaps this gentleman was saying is that maybe through a different kind of thinking, one can arrive at the understanding that there is no fixed self. Uh, if thinking itself has given birth to the idea of the self, I really doubt whether through thinking we can come out of that idea. That is something interesting because uh, if it's itself 
is something created by thought process, then how can another thought process, howsoever different it may be, bring it to an end? That's that's one that one question that comes to my mind. Uh, the idea that there is no fixed self, uh, a number of wise people and a number of liberated people have spoken about it. Uh, the Buddha gives the example of a chariot and he says that there is a there are horses in it, there are wheels in it, there is a seat, there are pe for people to sit on. And it is made up of so many different fragments, parts. But for our convenience, we call it a chariot. And he used the same analogy to describe the self. He says it's not something fixed. It is made up of different elements. You just call it the self as though it were something permanent, fixed, unchanging. In, uh, in one of the uh, books, biographies written about Krishnaji, there is a lady who has lost her husband. And she wants, she expects that Krishnaji would say something comforting that would uh, end her misery. But uh, Krishnaji asks her a question which makes her feel more disturbed than she already is. He says, uh, which husband are you talking about? Are you lamenting for? The one you fell in love with, the one you married, the one you lived your life with, the one who died, or the one who would have been here today if he had been alive. Perhaps pointing to the same truth that the self which we look upon as a fixed entity is in a state of flux, is constantly changing, which means not only week after week, but from moment to moment, the person, uh, the group of people who are meeting here now are not the same people who met last week. That's the actual meaning, which is a truth which cannot, which one is not capable of perceiving directly. Otherwise, uh, it is said that the very fact of the impermanence of everything liberated the Buddha. He became enlightened the moment he saw that everything was anitya, which means the man who boards the train at Kolkata and the man who gets down the train in Mumbai are not the same person. They are two people. They have changed. So this constantly changing self is something that perhaps one has to perceive directly. A knowledge of this doesn't help. Just a few uh, questions that come mm, to my mind. I want to share them briefly and then invite uh, Gerard or Harshadji to speak on the subject. One is knowledge of self is very important because if one doesn't know what one is, there is no basis, firm basis for one's thinking and actions. I often think of the analogy of a shirt. Like somebody stitches a shirt for me without having my measurements. Either the shirt will be too loose or too tight. In either case, it won't be comfortable for me. Now we do something, we think something, we choose a career, we make a decision without knowing what we are. And the reason is there is this feeling of discomfort all the time, which expresses itself in the form of anxiety, worry. So uh, because we don't get our measurements right, the, t the tailor doesn't, hasn't measured, taken the measurements correctly, and he has just stitched the shirt for me. So it's never comfortable. So that's how I live without knowing myself, whatever I do. I mean, we choose a career 
and are that dissatisfied all our lives. They keep changing one job, we take up another job, again we feel dissatisfied. Does it happen because of lack of self-knowledge? Because we don't exactly know what we are. Krishnaji said that the one of the basic purposes of education is to find your hidden true talent. And he also said that the purpose of education is to know oneself. So do, do we have disorder in our life, in our relationships, in our society? Because what we do, what we think is not based on accurate self-knowledge. Knowledge, uh, now, now uh, let, 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 let me talk a little about self-knowledge in, in the sense that we often think that it's a technique for self-improvement. There are many motivational speakers who say you can know yourself, become more productive and so on and so forth. But I don't agree because self-knowledge can also be very disturbing. One really comes to know that one has no love, that one is full of jealousy. That can disturb one a lot. I don't know whether it leads to self-improvement. Krishnamurti will say that an improved self is also a self. We also need to understand perhaps the difference between what Krishnaji calls self and self as it is described in traditional religion with a capital S, which is something to be achieved, which is something that you actually are. For Krishnaji, self is just a bundle of memories. It is rooted in the past. Self is the past and has to be discarded. It has to be renounced. But not, not that one can follow a technique to renounce it, that negation of the self is a byproduct of attention, of awareness. I think that's what he's perhaps implying. It's not a goal-oriented activity, therefore, it is not something that one does for self-improvement. Uh, I think while trying to know oneself, some of the basic emotions have to be understood very deeply. And one such emotion is fear. Because fear is in the very nature of this consciousness as, as I know it. It seems that many of our actions, decisions are actuated by fear. They are guided by fear, our relationships, the need for security, the need to have more, more love, more things. There's a very strong, deep fear underneath all that. If you scratch our smiles a little bit, one can see the face of fear lurking underneath it. So fear is, seems to be one of the most fundamental primordial emotions that we have. I have uh, read somewhere that basically human beings have two emotions. They have fear and they have love. And love comes into being only when fear has ended completely. I think when we talk about self-knowledge, fear is a strong emotion, a very powerful emotion that governs many of our activities. I think it has to be understood seriously. Another urge or desire that needs to be understood is the mm, pursuit of pleasure, which is also very strong in us. Knowing oneself also implies knowing uh, our body, and knowing our relationship with other people, with our surroundings, and to a great extent, knowing our relationship with nature, of which we are a part, but because of some illusion, some 
wrong, incorrect thinking, we have cut ourselves off from nature. I am reminded of a very interesting statement that Albert Einstein made. He said that man, I am not quoting him exactly verbatim, but he said something to the effect that because of an optical delusion in the consciousness, I am using his words, he said, because of an optical delusion in the consciousness, man has separated himself from the universe. And he must make every effort to see that the division ends. And something, somebody, like great scientist, not a philosopher, uh, who can be brushed aside by scientists as um, someone who is not, who has lost his marbles but somebody like of the stature of William, none other than Albert Einstein saying this. Makes a lot of sense. Even Carl Jung, the philosopher, psychologist who was a disciple of Sigmund Freud, he said, if you look within, you awaken. If you look without, you just dream. So interesting insights that people have shared about the need for knowing oneself. There's one more statement that I would like to repeat. Krishnaji says that we are not just talking about the management of the self, not about substituting something so-called bad with something good, not about sublimation, we are not talking about self-improvement. We are not talking about practicing great things in order to become better tomorrow. He says we are talking about something entirely different. We are talking about the cessation of the self, not the continuation, its continuity in a modified form howsoever noble it may appear to others. I think with that, I would like to end. It's a vast topic. Many areas will always remain uncovered. I just would like to end here and request Harshaji first, and then Gerard, and then leave the floor open for all participants to share their observations, to ask their questions, to respond to what others have said. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chaitanya Nagar, sir. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Harsad Parikh, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Chaitanya. Um, about this knowing oneself, I feel that there are two kinds of self within us. One is the self created by thinking. Like Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. But this thinking, to whom the thinking happens. So that I consider the true self, this false self created by thinking, it can be known. All our thoughts, feelings, one can know about it. But the true self to whom thinking happens, it cannot be known, but it can be realized or felt non-verbally. So, True self cannot be known, but the false self can be can be known. And uh, other thing which comes to my mind is that one sloka of Shankaracharya, it says, I am not body, I am not mind, I am Chidananda Rupam Shivoham Shivoham. Uh, and um, our true nature is 
this body it grows old and dies and the mind also keeps on changing body keeps on changing but there is something which is looking at the thought itself that witness uh, that true self or choiceless awareness it is there and so there is something within us which collects all these thoughts or it can see everything very clearly and that thing or it is not a thing that state of awareness or choiceless awareness or intelligence whatever you call it it such a state exists for human beings and when such a freedom comes in one's life then only there is a freedom from anger or jealousy or violence all these problems they come from thinking and this thinking can be observed with something which is not thinking and that is our real nature that is what all the um, sages have said even when when but krishna ji uses the self as self a false self it is created by thinking and krishna ji doesn't talk about true self but he says about choiceless awareness and uh, that is the central uh, thing the real freedom is to come to that state of awareness non verbal seeing looking listening so that is the real self which cannot be known but it can be realized and uh, when somebody says watch every thought krishna ji says to watch every thought again one needs the freedom from thinking to watch thinking otherwise one remains in in the plane of thinking so i consider thinking is like a flat surface two dimensional surface and awareness is something above the surface and it can see the whole surface so awareness is in a different dimension than thinking and uh, how why it is not uh, awakened in most human beings the reason is that this awareness is really is there but there are dense clouds of thinking and uh, since we have learned a language and we have learned many subjects our surface mind is full of thinking only and uh, it is bubbling uh, it's like a surface of a lake and it is always in that there is thinking feeling and it is always bubbling and it is judging and uh, from that even this thinking can say that there is nothing apart from thinking but some people when when they come to a state where thinking is completely still there is a kind of a discontinuity in thinking then this awareness which is buried underneath can come through that opening the silence between two thoughts and it can come above and then it can look so even if happens even once in a person's life that this awareness is awakened and can see thinking very clearly then that is the re- our true nature and then it may go away this kind of awareness but again a person becomes very silent very curious attentive again that awareness can come and look at thinking it can even look at when the anger is arising uh, this awareness can look 
and that look is the action which dissolves anger or fear or jealousy so so all our problems come from thinking but there is something above thinking which can look at thinking clearly and the real uh, uh, solution of our all problems whether it's a scientific problems or a, a psychological problems or problems of environment or um, all these economic problems the real source is thinking and there is something else apart from thinking when a person comes to that dimension which is different than thinking then the problems there is a real freedom freedom to observe and then it is a different way of living in which we can look at people we can look at trees we can look at our own thoughts everything non verbally clearly and in that there is a, a continuous refreshing goes on in the brain so i think that is what uh, i would say that this true self cannot be known it can be only false self which is coming from thinking can be observed clearly oh that is all i have to say thank you gerard sir you need to unmute gerard is muted oh i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, gerard yes yeah hello yeah say something sir <clears throat> that is a very that is it is a very difficult to- question chatnya really to know oneself is maybe the result of a, pro- a thinking process most of the time it is a result of a thinking process the image you have about yourself but i think that christoji is pointing out that this process is no good it is just a collection of images and what is the real question is the capacity to come to the living present in the now and that's the real problem for us because we have been educated to to be and to live in the future or in the past so to know yourself if you look at the grammar it is the it is present verb in the present you know but actually it is not possible as long as you realize that you are in in a collection of the of past images or future or something you desire to become you want to become or you have been you has been so the the knowing the 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 living present is something is 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 a capacity that you are deprived it is like a an animal in a cage an animal in a cage is living but he is not free he is not capable to live his own life so human beings are 
unfortunately, deprived from being what they are really. They want to become or they have been something. So that's um, the tragedy that I can I can see. The tragedy of man is that he is not living anymore. He is not living the real life. He is only dealing with images about himself, what he would like to be, or what he he, he wants to become. So, to realize that, you have to come into the in the present. The understanding is in the present only, and that's what we we have lost the capacity to be in the present. So we have to realize that tragedy and come back to the present. And then, of course, everything is changing. I was, uh, I don't know if you have read the, the book about uh, uh, Arari, about the sapiens, Homo sapiens. And he is describing very clearly how human beings are living in a in a fancy in a in a dream they are not really living the real life they are living in a dream so that is something we we have difficulty to realize because that dream is just going on from childhood you know and it, So, only when there is a tragedy in your life, when, when, when something terrific happens, somebody you love dies, or you lost your job, or you, you have a, a cancer, you have a terrible disease, maybe you are going to die. Only when that happens, there is a, some kind of awakening possible. But most of the time, most of the time, we are living in a kind of dream that is going on. And so there is no, there is no questioning. There is no realization of what is happening. So Krishnamurti, I think, is just pointing out, is inviting us to look, to stop and look. This is something we are not used to do, to, to, to stop and look. So that's uh, what I would say. The, the most important part of what you said, Gerard, was that though we have lost the capacity, we can retrieve it. We have that proprioception we have the capacity to look at this predicament to this tragedy to to look at this tragedy that you referred to so that's a positive thing i think if you just look at this that we are in a mess and we can never come out of it then that may make feel may make one feel very dejected, very frustrated, depressed. Not that just for the sake of ending the depression, you create a positive feeling. Uh, you, you, one has that capacity, as uh, Harshad was saying, it has become dormant, but it is there. Because that self-awareness is something that human beings are endowed with, that they know what's going on. When you react angrily, you know that you have reacted angrily. Now, it may happen a few moments later, it may happen at the very moment uh, the anger arises, but that is a saving grace that we have. I mean, it's not a 
completely bleak and dismal situation where that's what we are. We, we, I mean, people like K have pointed to this possibility. They have said that this is what the human predicament is. This is your situation, but one can go beyond the human condition. And that awareness is perhaps the moment of awareness is when one uh, transcends that condition, even though it's very, uh, it, it could be very momentarily, very temporarily, but one does, one can do it. And we all have done it. We have looked at our anger. We have looked at our own mess. Not later, but at the uh, when when we are actually contributing to it, one just become aware, and it stops. Then the only problem, the only difficulty is perhaps to to live in that state, uh, and to see that. One grows in awareness. With attent one, one becomes more attentive. Uh, this attentiveness deepens, and the grip of past, of the image making mechanism, <coughs> slows down. Slows down. Begins to wither away with attention, with awareness. So. Yes, the situation is tragic, but we still have the capacity. The floor is open. I think we all can participate now. Thanks, Gerard, for your input. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody who wants to speak, please unmute yourself. There are, there are yes. two people. Varmaji, yes, please. Go ahead. Is it audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. sir. Chaitanyaji talked about structure of I instead of who am I. He said structure of I is more important and there is nothing personal about it. But experientially and seeing around and with myself, moments of suffering are different in different individuals. Moments of suffering. We receive the world different, differently. We all receive the world differently. Perceptions are different. So what Parikji was talking about thinking self usually and conditioning what gets conditioned is that self only which is personal to me. So will you clarify a little bit on this? Because he, he talked about most of the time he was addressing individuals and not collective. He said collective is no good. So whether this self, uh, which we are referring to, is individual or not, and then only it will be of any use. Because if I see myself as I am, moment to moment, my thinking, my reactions, my attachments, differently as individual, then only my suffering can be seen properly. And there can be uh, something, something could happen to me for, the, for, the, for that suffering. So please clarify Chaitanya Ji a little bit about this. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Varmaji. What I meant was that your reactions may be different from mine. Yes. The way uh, Mukesh Ambani thinks and the way Bill Gates thinks, yes. Modi thinks, and the way I think yes. may be different. But when we talk about the structure of I, what we mean is that we all think, we all react. That yes. is the fundamental truth. We all react. 
in certain situations we react and our reactions are based on our past experiences and memories so when you talk about the structure of the eye that's what you mean the, the very basic traits that the eye has when you say who am i it may say i may start relating my own experiences with somebody maybe some anecdote <clears throat> but when i talk about the structure of the eye itself which is common to all of us then perhaps a clearer understanding uh, uh, may be possible but you think of course all of us there may be 7.5 billion different kinds of reactions to the same situation the fact is that there are reactions there is the fact is that there is no non judgmental observation that is not happening the fact is we are all thinking we are trying to solve the problems created by thinking through thinking through the apparatus of thinking only that's what i meant when i when i said krishna murthy preferred the question what is i to who am i i think that's all maybe somebody else wants to take this question harshad or uh, kanchan is there sarita ji is there Sachidanand ji is there. So many friends, all wise people here. Another one, sir. Another one. Parikh ji said, "True self is equal to awareness." Is it something like Sakshi in our old, uh, uh, yeah, this thing, Yan? But but I think uh, Harshad ji, I would refrain from using. Um, something like true self world like because that that very expression means you have concluded that what you have is a false self then from that you posit posit a true self you project a project a true self i am saying that all i have is this self i don't know whether it is true or false all i have to deal with is my own reaction my own reactivity now i from there i don't want to imagine that there is such a thing as a true self because that can make my situation more complicated okay okay so i don't want to imagine a state which is true and uh, term the state i am in as false because that's all i have <laughs> another observation sir by listening to gerard we are not living in present he said that is the problem either in past or or in future is there time in eternal flux is there time in eternity may may i say something please because we are discussing all these things through words and different people are using different words for the same thing the real thing is non verbal and uh, it cannot be uh, really expressed in words like awareness we we have made this word awareness choiceless awareness krishna ji but then one may be just thinking like one one lady she came and she said that she is aware of all her problems and krishna ji says awareness dissolves problems so why these problems are are remaining why there are so many problems in spite of having awareness so i think that is the trap this awareness is maybe just a part of thinking but the re- the real thing the real awareness is not part of thinking and somebody like raman maharshi may say true self or upanishad say something like that different people are using different words but they are all pointing out that there is something apart from thinking which can look at thinking very very clearly and when that thing which is not a thing when it is awakened then our life really changes 
uh, and for that also our the structure of the brain also changes a different quality of the brain comes into existence and that is why krishna ji was saying that he wanted to create a new brain so the quality of our brain is directly related to that state which he calls choiceless awareness or something like that until then we remain with the what knowledge which we have gathered so much and from knowledge we are speaking but i feel that krishna ji was not talking when he was giving a talk it was not coming from the knowledge it was coming from direct insight from silence and so one can really feel that there is a space between the words between the sentences so when there is this awareness even our way of speaking and listening and looking everything changes it it cannot be described but because it has to be felt for oneself that state in which the thing not the word like word is not the thing like the word parrot is not the thing which flies so but because we have learned so much our mind really is not able to give up this words ideas and through that words and ideas we are asking deeper questions but then we will remain only in that plane of asking questions through thinking and finding answer through thinking and not really maybe not changing so it requires a uh, very uh, curiosity attention energy to really look from where our the words are coming you know so unless that uh, we can go on asking hundreds of questions and even getting answers but that may not change the the structure within that the real brain and uh, the a different way of looking at things listening and all that so okay i have finished yeah, there's just one thing very interesting i want to say harshad and yeah uh, my other friend varma ji also that in, in krishna murti circle it's very common that people condemn thinking and words and they use it all the time also i mean what's wrong in using our words to express whatever understanding we have i mean i if you condemn thinking if you condemn words then you you are still there i mean where you were before either you become silent words are going on inside your mind or you verbalize them express them what difference it makes i mean i want to say something interesting funny i don't know whether you all understand hindi or urdu there was a famous uh, uh, urdu poet his name was akbar allahabadi he was a high court judge but he was a good poet also <laughs> so he wrote one couplet that reminds me of people who are using words all the time using thinking and at the same time condemning so okay use words don't condemn see that you are using so he says about uh, he says i i will first use the original couplet and then translate it for you see whether i can do it he says sheikh ji sheikh ji peete gaye kehte gaye है बड़ी बदमजा अच्छी नहीं इट मीन शेख इज अ इस्लामिक और अ रिलीजियस प्रीस्ट अथॉरिटी एंड ही इज नॉट सपोज टू ड्रिंक विथ एल्कोहल बट दिस फेलो ही केप्ट ऑन ड्रिंकिंग केप्ट ऑन ड्रिंकिंग एंड ही केप्ट ऑन सेंग इट्स अ वेरी नास्टी थिंग ऑफ नो यूज एट ऑल शेख जी पीते गए कहते गए है बड़ी बदमजा अच्छी नहीं तो आई ऑफन वेन आई वेन वी यूज वर्ड एंड कंडेम इट आई एम ऑफन रिमाइंडेड ऑफ दिस कंप्लेट आई मीन वी 
are what we are. We have to only begin with where we are, not criticize that. Oh, now I'm using my intellect. I shouldn't. Now I'm using words. I should not. I think that thinking has to uh, come to an end. That's all. <laughs> Sushil ji, you are saying something, but not audible. We only oh, see the unmute. Mute. Unmute, Karla, Sushil ji. Yeah. Why, why do murti? Why do murti? Please, please ask your question or make comment, whatever you like, wanted to. Yes, you are unmute. raising hand. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have a few comments, not any questions. Uh, first of all, there is a talk about the self, and uh, there was a discussion. Uh, I feel the self is made up of various parts. It is nothing but a bundle of memories and uh, uh, emotions and uh, feelings. And if all these uh, memories are dissolved, the self, as we know, will not be there at all. Uh, so, as uh, Krishnaji was uh, telling a number of times, uh, uh, and in, in the video also we have seen, uh, if there's a watch, and uh, it got many parts. And if you remove all the parts one by one, uh, there is no thing as watch. There are only various parts are there. <laughs> Likewise, the self is not an entity, a fixed thing, a permanent thing. It is nothing but a, a bundle of memories and uh, emotions. The other thing I wanted to say is about uh, the consciousness. Uh, Krishnaji talked in a, a very a number of times, the real transformation, the radical transformation of the human consciousness is necessary and uh, uh, that will solve all the human problems. Uh, this consciousness uh, is filled with a lot of things put in there by the, by the thought, uh, like our uh, agonies, our fears, our pursuit of pleasure, our sorrows, all our difficulties, our jealousies, our anger, everything is part of the consciousness and it is filled with uh, the creation of various things by the human thought. Uh, so the human beings are eternally in sorrow and misery because of this. Uh, there is another possibility, I am talking from uh, what Professor Krishna was uh, telling about, he talks of two faculties in the human consciousness. One faculty is the subjective faculty that is created by thought and its uh, crea creations. Other one is the universal faculty comprising of observation, awareness, and attention. These two faculties combine together and create what is called an experience. But Krishnaji never talked of uh, two faculties in the human consciousness. But Professor Krishna says it, he finds it convenient to understand the consciousness when you uh, keep these two faculties in mind. Uh, and uh, in fact, the faculty of observation is uh, uh, available to all human beings inherently, right from the time of birth. In fact, the newborn baby, the faculty of observation is manifesting earlier than the faculty of thought. Uh, that is a fact. So my point here is, if you are able to understand the consciousness, and uh, uh, because human beings have given a lot of importance to the thought faculty, because of the great things it has done in the physical world, in the technological world, with a lot of inventions, etc., the faculty of observation has been buried down. And unless that faculty is allowed to uh, come to surface and uh, take charge, the, the, the radical transformation in the human consciousness as we are talking about may not happen. And that is the crux of the problem. So how to dissolve the, uh, the creation of thought, which is embedded in the consciousness, filled with the, uh, the consciousness, filled with the creations of the thought. That is the basic question. For that again, uh, meditation is the right answer. And uh, uh, in, in, like uh, uh, the right kind of meditation, where watching all the thoughts as they arise in the consciousness is an important thing. I don't believe there is a true self and a super self, etc. Uh, Krishna ji also mentioned about that. It is nothing but you are pushing the self up or pushing the self backwards. 
but it is only the self. There is only one thing is there that is self. There is a creation of thought, and if you understand the thought fundamentally, basically, completely, you will be able to understand the self also. Thank you. I want to ask a question to Mr. Chetan Nagar, sir. Sir. May I? Yes, sir. Sir, I am having suppose pain in my right leg. and you don't have got that information i would get the information so is there any center or not available to me or not because i, I it is very clear that i am having pain in my right leg so automatically a center is cre uh, created so is there any self there or not what do you have to say this thing happens with my thought also the same thing doesn't happen with the thought because the pain is real the body is real uh psychological pain just can be imaginary it can be imaginary it it, it can be uh, the fear of something that will happen to me after a month when i get some viral infection that that fear has no basis that that's a, a completely imaginary fear but pain is a real thing it, every human being every animal even trees they all experience pain it's part of nature nothing wrong with it your reaction to But, pain is what what matter how you respond to that pain you had pain yesterday sir, even uh, my, my basic question was whether there is any center available to me or not i i is having any center or not when you have physical pain physical pain other things no no other not other sense No, physical pain okay. has a center. You 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 experience it. You you as a as a body, your brain says you have pain. You take medicine or you know find out how to deal with it. It's a real thing, not the psychological suffering. It is not the same as psychological. I'm just trying to distinguish between the physical pain and psychological suffering. Here we are talking mainly about primarily about psychological suffering, not the physical pain. Which so is there also you consider uh, as psychological only and not uh, physical desire and again it's the difference between what pain is to the to body need is to the body and desire is a psychological uh, process of becoming but not need you need to wear warm clothes when it's very cold that's the need the body needs it you need uh, uh, a roof over your head because the body needs that security just to survive now you may ask what is the need to survive at all that's another question but the body needs food the body needs clothes the body needs shelter and that that's a mm, part of mm, a natural movement mm -hmm. even an animal when it's mm -hmm. thirsty it needs water it will go un under a tree and drink water when it's too hot so there is a difference between the two the need has its uh, place desire has its place and one can see that they are two different things so we are coming to an understanding that uh, uh, physically physiologically center is there but psychologically center is not there yeah yes Arek sir, time yeah. is already over. Yeah, so, yes. Please announce the lecture by Javier on seventh of February, Sunday at eleven a.m. That is the information which is to be given. And oh, just I wanted to say, उन कुल काब किताबों को हम काबिले जब्ती समझते हैं, जिनको पढ़के लड़के बाप को खप्ती समझते हैं. <laughs> from the same poet uh, good good you have to translate for gerard you have to translate it there's a there's a message we are all slaves to words however great sacred they may be it has no relevance absolute silence and total freedom is the way but again these are words Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, 
थैंक यू संडे नेक्स्ट संडे का टाइम क्या ग्यारह बजे जेल साहब हाँ ग्यारह बजे ग्यारह बजे एट इलेवन ओ क्लॉक एट इलेवन ओ क्लॉक सेम टाइम स्पीकर स्पीकर विल बी हैवियर हाँ जेल स्पीकर स्पीकर और टॉपिक और टाइम दोनों अनाउंस कर दें ताकि और लोग क्लियर हो जाएर and all of you of course yeah yeah, yeah definitely definitely yeah. definitely and more than this I, other yeah. than uh, who have not attended they are you are going to request others also to come here and listen dialogue between yeah. arshad parik harsh tankha chetan nagar and jerad am i right now uh, harsh tankha will be starting Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. We yeah. can. Yeah. If he yeah. is there, because we have given him freedom. If he yeah. he is involved mm -hmm. in his case, he will be not coming. Then okay. you have okay. to start. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank nice you. of you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks okay. to everybody. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank thanks every participant and all the speakers who have who have contributed themselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank Please close the close the meeting. Please.